We've spent quite a bit of time this chapter talking about the binomial distribution. The binomial probability setting has four requirements to it, which you should be very familiar with so far. In the terms of our variable of interest, we're looking at the number of successes that occur in this fixed number of trials. The geometric case now should seem very similar. There are two outcomes, failure and success. The outcomes are independent. We have the same probability for each success. But the big difference here is that we don't know how many trials we have. So there's not this fixed number of five trials or something like that. Our variable of interest is the number of trials it takes to obtain our first success rather than a number of successes in a fixed number of trials. So that's the big distinction between them. I want to start with an example um, that might seem geometric but violates one of the important conditions for both the binomial and geometric settings, and that's independence. So if we want to know the probability that it takes five tries to pull a jack from a standard deck of cards and we draw without replacement, then these trials are not independent of one another. We can still answer this question, and the, the um, statement itself might seem geometric because it, we want to know how long it will take until something occurs. Let's take a look at how this would work. So if it's going to take us five tries, one, two, three, four, five, and this fifth try is when we get our first jack, you need to think about failing all of the previous trials. So there are four jacks in a deck, so there are 48 cards that are not jacks. So there's a 48 out of 52 chance that we do not get a jack on the first try. On the second, there are 47 non-jacks, since we are drawing without replacing the cards, and 51 cards total. Then 46 out of 50, and 45 out of 49. On our fifth trial, we have four jacks left in the deck. We have 48 cards. And so if we multiply these probabilities together, we would get uh, the probability of interest here. But this, again, is not a geometric setting because they're not independent from one another. When we pose the same question, but now we are replacing the cards, so we are using independent trials, Look at how the problem is simplified. We have 48 non-jacks out of 52 cards. And so we want a non-jack on the first try, a non-jack on the second, and that has the same probability because we've put the card back in. So we'll continue on, and for our four tries, we are going to not get a jack, and then finally on the fifth try, we get one. Here's how we can simplify this process. If we want to obtain our first jack on the fifth pull, we need to first fail four times. So this equation, much simpler than the previous one, and that's, these are the types of problems that we'll be looking at in this section. In general, here is our geometric formula. We have the probability that our first success is on our nth try. So again, x is always talking about the first success occurring. We're going to fail, so have 1 minus p, one less times than our number of trials. And then we will finally succeed, so we'll have our probability of success on the last try. Remember that sometimes you'll see the notation q instead of 1 minus p, so that's another way we can represent this formula. Many of the geometric problems are very, very simple if they're worded in a similar fashion to drawing the jack out of the deck of cards with replacing the cards. Fail uh, so many times and succeed on your final trial. The problems can get more complicated. So if we wanted to know the probability that it takes more than three rolls 
to get a 4 on a die. So our success in this case is rolling a 4. The probability of success is 1 6 and so our probability of failure is 5 6. This is a little bit more complicated because we want to know that uh, it, it will take more than so many tries to get our first success. We're going to start by looking at a probability distribution to think about how we can answer this question. So take a look at what we've created here. Um, this probability distribution, we're rolling until we get a 4. The probability of getting a 4 on our first try is 1 sixth. So I've put 1 sixth into decimal form here, just for ease of calculation. The probability of getting a 4 on our second try, and only on our second try, means that we would fail on the first roll and succeed on the second. So if you find the product of these two fractions, it will give you this decimal here. Then on the third try means we'll fail twice, succeed on the second, and so forth and so on. Take a look at what these values are doing. Because with each additional roll, we're multiplying by another 5 sixths, which is smaller than 1, our probabilities will continue to get smaller and smaller. So just to give you a real rough idea of the shape, it's going to do something like this. So if we're trying to answer the question that it will take more than three rolls to get a four, we can think of this as the complement of getting three or fewer rolls. So if we were to first find the probability that we roll a four in the first three tries so that x is less than or equal to three, that would be the probability that we get it on the first plus the second plus the third. So if we add up those associated probabilities with what we had on the last screen, we would get 0 0.4213, approximately. So if this is the probability that it takes us three or fewer rolls to get a four, then the probability that it takes us more than three, again, is the complement. So if we take one minus 0.4213, we get our desired probability of 0.578. So there's roughly a 58% chance that it will take more than three rolls to get a four on the fair roll of a die. Just to flash back real quick to the slide with the table to show you how I'm thinking through this, if I want the probability of more than four, I'm trying to add up an infinite geometric series. I can't do that discreetly because it's infinite. I can't add all of these up because I don't know when to stop. Now eventually those probabilities will get so small they'll be insignificant. However, it is simpler for us to just think of this as the complement of the first three occurrences. So we just went through this scenario where the probability that we'll take more than n trials to see our first success is 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to n. Another formula that will work is this one right here. Totally up to you which one you use. I tend to focus on this first one just because it makes a little more sense in my head and so it's easier to remember, but I just want to verify that this other formula works as well. And take a look at what this formula says we're going to do. It says we're going to fail n times. So if we want the probability that it's going to take us more than three rolls, that means we have to fail for three rolls. 
On the next slide, I'm going to show you that these give us the same result. All I've done here is recopy down the calculations that we had done originally. Now I'm going to show using the other formula, taking the probability of failure to the nth power gives us the same result. So 1 minus the probability of success raised to the third power simplifies to 5 6 to the third power and pop that in your calculator you will get the same result. So it's up to you which formula you want to use. Neither of these formulas will be represented exactly on your formula card. The purpose of this slide is just to show you how you would answer a question such as rolling our die in one coherent, coherent stream of thought. So as you did with the binomial setting, you would describe the random variable first. So x is the number of rolls required to get the first four. You would define the parameters. So uh, we're told we're talking about more than three rolls before we observe our first success. And our probability of success is 1 sixth. The probability that we're looking at, because it's more than three, x is greater than three, notice the notation. This is how I like to calculate these problems, but use what makes sense to you. And then we have our final answer. We put our finding into words, and it might look something like this. Very specific to what the original question asked. I encourage you to both understand the formulas themselves, as well as um, be able to calculate these on multiple choice problems. Should you have a multiple choice problem, you want to use your calculator, it's more efficient. Should it be a written problem, it's okay to use your calculator, but you want to try to show the formulas that you're using as much as possible. So the calculator should be used more to confirm that you're getting the correct answers. Based on what we did with the binomial distributions, Hopefully these make sense to you. The PDF for equality, the CDF will give us everything below and equal to a certain point, and then um, the, the greater than scenario would be 1 minus the CDF, just as with the case with um, binomial. When you plug these values into the geometric distribution, you'll list your probability of success first and your number of trials second. If that's not working on your calculator, let me know because there may have been some updates on some of your calculators um, and not on others. Last thing to discuss is the mean, the variance, the standard deviation of the geometric random variables. Unlike the binomial situation, we won't be able to represent these by the normal curve because if you remember what any geometric distribution is going to look like, it's going to continuously get smaller and smaller and smaller until the probabilities are essentially zero. By no means does this look like a normal distribution. So we won't have the option of using those calculations, but we can still calculate the mean, variance, and standard deviation. So the mean of the distribution, 1 over p, so 1 over the probability of success. That's our expected value, how many times we can expect something to occur before we observe the first success. Remember that this is our variance because it's sigma squared. And so then our standard deviation would just be the square root of the variance. These are also formulas that you need to memorize because they are not given to you on the um, formula card. Just to wrap things up with our example, if we want to find the mean and standard deviation of the geometric di distribution for rolling a die until we observe a 3, or I guess our example was until we observe a 4, same idea because it's still the same probability as of success, uh, we would take 1 over p, so 1 over 1 sixth is 6, so that's our expected number of rolls until we observe a 4. To find the standard deviation, 1 minus 1 sixth all over 1 sixth squared. Check that we get about 5, 4, 7, 7, 2. And each of these are rolls of the die. So it might seem um, a little 
counterintuitive to you that it would take six rolls before you would observe the six, the first four. However, look at how variable the distribution is in comparison to that. It can certainly happen before the six rolls, but we would expect um, the six rolls in our long-term behavior.